Welcome to the Vineyard Church Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. For more information on this podcast or other resources, go to vineyardlive.us. To learn more about us, go to the vineyardchurch.us. In the winter of 1914, the world was five months into the worst war it had ever seen. For years, there had been mounting tensions in Europe that were lit aflame by the assassination of an archduke. And before we knew it, countries across Europe and beyond were dragged into what we now call World War I. It would go on in time to claim more than 15 million lives. But that first Christmas in 1914, something really special and really beautiful happened. The Germans and the British were across uh, trenches from each other, and they spent all Christmas Eve firing at one another, trying to take each other out. But in the evening of Christmas Eve, the British looked and they saw that the Germans were decorating their trenches with candles. And they listened and they heard the Germans beginning to sing Christmas carols. Kind of stunned and for lack of some other response, they decided to return in kind and they began to sing Christmas carols back to the Germans. One side began shouting Christmas greetings to the other back and forth. And the next morning, a brave soldier climbs out of his trench unarmed and walks to the no man's land between the two battle lines. This act of courage sparks one other soldier and another and another and another. And before you know it, as many as 100,000 soldiers participated in what has now been labeled the Christmas truce. They met in the middle. They exchanged gifts. This is a real photograph. They gave each other Christmas cards. In fact, somebody even found a soccer ball and they joined in a friendly game of soccer, believe it or not. It's a beautiful and inspiring picture when two sides who literally hours before had been trying to kill one another embraced their common humanity and expressed something else and said, Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of can't help but feel like I wish some version of something like that could happen in our current political climate. It feels like we've got sides that are entrenched, shooting at one another, just trying to do anything they can to take each other out. And I would love to ask this question today. Is it possible that there could be something that could lift us above that battle? Is there something higher that could bring us together rather than driving us apart? And what I'm going to suggest is that if we are citizens of heaven, if our citizenship in God's kingdom is informing our participation in earthly politics, then the answer to that question is yes. Now, before we take one step further in, I just want to say, don't worry I'm not trying to influence anybody's vote in any direction, okay? Don't take this blue that I'm wearing as an endorsement of a political party. I just happen to like the color and I wanted to wear it today, okay? Like, we're, we're not gonna meddle with your votes. That's not the point here, okay? The point is we wanna wrestle with what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven and engage with our natural political system. And today, the shocking proposal that I want to suggest is this. If we are a citizen of heaven, then we should actually be glad the other side is there. Believe it or not. And with that, we better just start praying because it's like, what? Okay. (laughs) Jesus, I just want to like right from the beginning, Lord, we just like welcome you. You are the king of kings, you are the Lord of lords, and the government rests upon your shoulders. And God, we just want to say our loyalty is to you, and we want to invite you to come and be the teacher among us today. God, we want um, our, our following of you to include every part of our lives, including this political thing. 
And so we ask, open the eyes of our heart today. Speak to us today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So, okay, before we dive in, let me quickly recap what we've covered so far in our series. We started a few weeks ago, and we asked this question, how does God's government and our natural governments, what is the relationship? What's the intersection between those two? And what we found is that what God is working to do is to incarnate his government through the natural political systems of our world, such that his government finds expression here on this earth. We then continued and we asked this question, what is the foundation of God's government? And we found that it was righteousness and justice. These two things which we hold on to um, with both hands. Last week, we we found that to navigate this issue well, we need to make some space. We need to make space for those that we disagree with. We need to make space for the things that we might not know yet. And all of this leads us to what we're going to talk about today, which is how do we understand the other side of this whole political thing? Now, To unpack that, I want to start with the concept of a paradox. Now, um, a paradox is a common tool in Eastern teaching. And remember, the Bible was written to an Eastern culture, not a Western one. And so it's filled with a lot of examples of paradoxes. And we need to really kind of think and wrestle with that this morning. To to illustrate that, I want to read Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5. Here's what they say. Verse 4, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Okay, paraphrase. Somebody's doing something stupid, don't join it. Okay? Verse 5, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Paraphrase, somebody's doing something stupid, do join it. (laughs) Wait a minute. We literally have back-to-back verses here that say the exact opposite instructions. And this is Proverbs, right? It's supposed to be like the book of wisdom. What what gives here? Well, this is an example of a paradox. Now, here's a definition of a paradox, which I enjoy. A paradox is a pairing of seemingly contradictory concepts that reveal a hidden or an unexpected truth. See, what happens in a paradox is we have two things that have a tension between them. And both of these things, which head in opposite directions, are actually both somehow true. And the tension between them is meant for us to elevate our thinking and see a higher truth than exists in either one of them. Okay? Here's here's an example of one that that I like. The more you fail the more likely you are to succeed. It's a great paradox right there. The more you fail, the more likely you are to succeed. Now, when you hear that at first, if you're like me, you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. I mean, success and failure are opposites. So how, am I, how is failing giving me more success? That doesn't make any sense. Until you start thinking a little bit deeper on it, and then you realize, well, perhaps it is that to succeed more I need to make more chances. And if I take more chances, then I'm gonna fail more too. Maybe success and failure aren't opposites. Maybe they're two sides of the same coin. And now our thinking has just been elevated on the subject. We're seeing it in a different light. This is what paradoxes do. Now, to make this uh, really concrete and to give a visual picture, we have our science experiment for the morning. Are you ready? Okay, one per. thank you, Samuel. Samuel is ready. This is for you now. Everybody else, you get to come along with the ride because Samuel is ready. So I have here a donut. Now, this isn't just because it's Sunday morning, you know, and we're all thinking about coffee and donuts. This donut is going to teach us something. Like... Everything else in our lives, this donut is three-dimensional. But the question I want to ask today is this. What does a two-dimensional picture of a donut look like? 
And a good illustration for this would be to look at its shadow. A shadow is a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional object. And so let's look at what the shadow of our donut looks like, okay? Now, you might, you might have guess in mind. You might already envision it here. But look at this. Here's what the shadow of a donut looks like. I think we're going to cut to our other camera here so you can see it a little more clearly. In three, two, one. Maybe not. <laughs> Are we going to cut? Or not? It's awesome, guys. It's really good. Oh, there we go. Okay, here, look. Oh, the shadow of a donut is a circle. How many of you guys thought it was a circle, right? Shadow of a donut is a circle. It's brilliant, right? Except when uh, the shadow of a donut is a rectangle. Wait, except when uh, it's a circle. Except when it's a weird blob. Here's the, here's the point. You can't take a three-dimensional donut and cram it into one two-dimensional picture. Sometimes it's a circle, sometimes it's a rectangle, sometimes I'm gonna eat a bite, okay? <clears throat> mm, oh, that's good. That's my favorite kind, by the way. It took me three passes through Dunkin' Donuts to figure out how to order the one I wanted without being able to like go in and point. So I'm gonna enjoy this moment just for a second. This is what's happening with paradoxes. Paradoxes are saying, look, the truth is both a circle and a rectangle. And we go, how can the truth be both a circle and a rectangle? And it can be both a circle and a rectangle because it's a donut, not a shadow. But if the only thing you can do is look at the shadows, it looks contradictory. It looks like, hold on, that doesn't work, that doesn't make any sense. I'll give you another example. A lot of life works this way, okay? Let's think about parenting. Now, every one of us in here has been parented. Some of us are being parented right now. Some of us are parenting right now. But wherever you live on that whole spectrum, we have had the experience of parenting. And let me ask this. Does good parenting work to meet the child where they're at? Does it involve listening? Does it involve being empathetic? Does it involve um, responding with emotion and with compassion and with sensitivity? Do, does good parenting involve that? You know, there's like two people that think good parenting is involved that. Okay, good. Okay, now here's my other question. Does good parenting involve calling the child up to something? Does it involve actually not meeting where the child is at? but saying, look, here, this is where we're getting to. Does it involve not being uh, as uh, compassionate and emotional, but being sort of a, a calling up and a provoking to, to a better? Does good parenting include that? It does. But here's the funny thing. You can't do both of those at the same time. You're either meeting the child where they're at or you're calling them up. But you can't do both together. Why? Because parenting is not a circle or a rectangle. Parenting is a donut. Okay? <laughs> I know, we're all going to look at donuts totally differently after this. Okay, now why are we going into all of this? Here's why we're going into all of this. When we are asking the question, how does God's government incarnate itself through the governments of this world, we are asking a question about a three-dimensional government of God flowing into our two-dimensional natural political system. And therefore, I want to suggest to you, the answer to that question is paradoxical. Let me be more concrete. There are a lot of ways to divide up and to analyze different uh, political spectrums and political ideologies. For the sake of being concrete, I'm going to choose the two most common political stances, either conservative or progressive. We could ask this question, is God's government conservative or progressive? That's a great question to ask. Now, to examine that, I want to be a little more uh, careful in terms of what I mean by that. And we tend to think of conservative or progressive as having to do with perhaps certain policies, or if not certain policies, certain leaders. We identify concrete things to those. But I want to trace that uphill just a little bit, and I want to look at the viewpoint of conservatism, the viewpoint of progressivism. 
And the, the viewpoint of each of these actually comes a lot from the word itself. What, what the conservative mentality towards politics starts from this, this vantage point. There are good things that we ought to conserve. We need to protect the good and make sure we don't lose it. And so conservatism begins the conversation saying, what good things do we want to make sure we do not sacrifice as we move forward towards the future, whatever it is? Progressivism starts from a different conversation. Progressivism says the future could be better. So out with the old and in with the new. What can we change to improve, to progress? And you take these two kind of starting vantage points and you work their way down into the world we live today and you have the political parties and the leaders and the policies that we're all familiar with. But that's the kind of starting point for the conversation. So with that in mind, here's what I want to ask. Is God's government conservative or is it progressive? Well, let's look at the scriptures. We shouldn't just like make up answers, right? So here's a scripture in Jeremiah 6. Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. What is this verse saying? It's saying, look back and look at the good back there and hold on to it. In, in uh, Revelation 2, Jesus puts it this way. He's talking to one of the churches. It's that kind of section in the beginning of Revelation where he's got instructions for different churches. He says this, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. Go back to the good things that are in your history. Now we can read those things and say, oh, yeah, I knew it. I knew that God's government was conservative. I was totally right. I say, well, it is until it's not. <laughs> because in Isaiah, we have the other side. Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. He's saying something new is coming. Which, by the way, brief shout out to the new Vineyard EP, which is called, based on that verse, it was totally an accident and is not an endorsement of political liberal ideology. <laughs> okay? Something new is coming. Look forward. In Revelation, again, towards the end of the book, out of the oh, words of Jesus, and he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Is God's government a circle or a rectangle? God's government is a donut. And sometimes a donut shows up as a circle, and sometimes a donut shows up as a rectangle. You see, the thing with all of these paradox things is you can't fit everything of a donut into the two dimensions. And what I want to suggest is you can't fit everything of God's government into one political ideology. And therefore, having the both of them reveals more of God, not less. If you want to understand a donut, you know what the best thing you could do? Take as many pictures from as many sides as possible. And that's how you come to understand the donut. But here's, if we're not careful, here's what we do, okay? Both of these sides have a kernel of something that lives in God's heart. The kernel on the one side is, hold on to the good from before, don't lose it. And the kernel on the other side is, there is new and better ahead, go for it. Both of these have a kernel of truth on their side. And both of them have a list of errors and grievances. Why? Because they are human institutions. They are made of very imperfect people. And in fact, many of those people aren't even pursuing Jesus at all. And so we've got something of God on both sides. And we have things that aren't good on both sides. And what each of us do is we tally all that up. 
how much is this part of God worth in the positive? How much are these grievances worth in the negative? And we tally that up and we get to some conclusion. We say this side is positive and that side is negative or vice versa. And we say, that's my political ideology, whether that's for your whole life or for the next 15 minutes. That's how it works. And that, I want to say, is a good thing. That is how it is supposed to work. We are supposed to say, is my job to advocate for God's government to be a circle, or is my job to advocate for God's government to be a rectangle? You have a part to play in the whole, and it's good for you to play that part. But where we can go wrong is... We can say, okay, once I've done that calculation, once I know my side is to be a circle, then what I do is I look at the revelation of God as a circle and I point out all the errors on the side of a rectangle. I focus on the God side for me and the problems over there. And what I want to suggest to you is that is the exact wrong way to relate to the other side. Why? Because I am blind to my own flaws, and I am blind to God on the other side. And I'm never going to move forward until I start seeing what I'm not so good at seeing. So what I should do is I should do the tally calculation and say, I am supposed to represent God's government as a circle. That is good. But once I have done that, then I turn around and I say, now I want to work to see God's revelation on your side and my flaws, not yours. We don't take responsibility for the other side's problems. Since when does that advance anything in life? You take responsibility for your side's problems. And you know who can see that really clearly, more clearly than you? Them. So look at this, look at this, okay? If God's government's a donut, which means we have circles and rectangles, and you're supposed to be one or the other of them, and that is a good thing. Now, that means the other side is actually your best help to move forward. They have something of God that you don't have, and they see something that's not good on your side that you might not be able to see. That does not sound like an enemy to me. That sounds like an ally. And sometimes I think we can forget this. In, in, the, in the British government, they have a term which I absolutely love. They refer to the other political side as the loyal opposition. You know why they do that? Here's why they do that. Because what they're trying to remember in the entire political process is this. We both work for the crown. So you're actually not my enemy. We're both together trying to work for the crown who, who like is over this whole government. Now, we don't have a natural crown that we, that we work for. But you know whose crown we're working for? Jesus is. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. And we are working together to manifest his government. And so here's my question My action step for us today is this. Is there someone or is there something that you look at and you go, I have no idea how a citizen of heaven in their right mind could possibly believe that. Because if that's the case, I want to suggest to you, it might be there's something of God that you haven't seen yet. And I don't know about you, but I want to get every bit of God I can. You can stay exactly where you're at if you want. I don't want to stay where I'm at. I want to grow. I want to go forward. So it doesn't mean I'm hopping the fence. If I'm called to be a circle, learning from the rectangle doesn't mean I become a rectangle. It just means I realize this is my part to play, but you have a part to play too. And together we have something that's richer than either of us. A.W. Tozer, the profound Christian thinker and writer used to say it this way. He says, truth has two wings. I love that picture because why? If you've got two wings on a bird, you can take flight. But as soon as you only have one, you ain't going anywhere. (laughs) We are citizens of heaven. We're citizens of the donut. We're not citizens of the circle or of the rectangle. We're citizens of something bigger. 
Which means when we look at the other side, we see someone who's working to manifest another aspect of the same God's government. And that means they're not our enemy. We have no enemies if we're citizens of heaven, at least not flesh and blood ones, right? They are not our enemy. You know, in World War I, it was embracing the common humanity that allowed people to set down their weapons and rise above and meet each other on Christmas Day. We've got something better than our common humanity. We have God's government. It's God's government that allows us to go beyond and say, you know what? I'm not called to stand over there, but I can see that there's something of God over there too. And so I'm not cheering against you. I'm saying you represent God as much as you can, as well as you can, and I'm going to do the same. And together, we're more than either of us is by ourselves. Jesus, you are good, and we love you. And I thank you, God, that your government is so big and so multidimensional that it transcends our natural political systems. I thank you that there is more of you than any of us can grasp entirely, but that we can work to see more and more and more. And Jesus, I thank you that with all of this, Lord, as much as we get caught up in the shadows, as much as we get caught up in the circle or the rectangle, God, that none of those define your donut, which is bigger than all of them. And God, we say that's where our faith is. It's not in the shadows of um, conservatism or liberalism, God. Our faith is in your government, which transcends it all. And I thank you, God, that even though right now this time seems rocky and unstable and chaotic and, and messy, none of that is an indicator that you're losing the donut. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. It is sure in your hands, and you are as much King of kings and Lord of lords as you have ever been. And Lord, I thank you for that. Yeah. It is in your name we pray, and it is you who we now turn to worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the message today. To experience more powerful messages, go to vineyardlive.us or join our Vineyard Life Plus community to view conferences, trainings, and special teachings.